Today, I'm going to be showing you guys how I recreated the song Happiness by the 1975. This is a new single off their new record that's going to be coming out soon, and I'm super excited to hear it. We're going to be going over how to make disco drum samples, how to mix percussion loops together, some weird sound design stuff, and a whole lot more. But before we jump into that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I work as a remote guitar-based pop producer out of Seattle, Washington. I do one of these videos every Thursday to show people how to produce their own pop music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists and I did a whole album through Warner Music Group. So if you're a singer or songwriter who likes writing in this style and you want to hand off all the technical BS onto somebody else, I would check out the top link in the description and maybe I can help you produce your song. All right, now onto the video. So the first part is going to be these two guys, which are the electrics. When you listen to the original track, you can hear that there's kind of two different parts in the left and right. And I tried to sort of match that syncopation style that they have. You can hear that at any given time, only one of them is playing and they're sort of trading off space back and forth. So you have this sort of higher lead part juxtaposed with this lower part. And the fact that they have different syncopations and they're panned left and right makes them sort of dance around your head a bunch. For the tone, I just modded this 80s pop chorus preset in the Corey Wong Neural DSP plugin. I'm normally not a big fan of compression going into the amp, but with this track, it felt fitting since it's almost like a, a dance pop processing feel. And then the two of these guys are going into a basic channel strip on the bus. These slate channel strips are pretty cool. Basically, you decide what color you want with the channel strip, do some subtractive EQ, compression, additive EQ, some saturation or color if you want it, and then you use this trimmer at the very end to sort of balance out any volume difference. They're very practical strips. And then we have a little bit of reverb and delay on the sends. I'm using this Slate Verb Suite plugin on this room preset. It's called Music Club. I wanted a reverb that wasn't super long and ambient sounding. I wanted it to be more of like a live venue vibe, if that makes any sense. And then with these guitars, I have a little bit of a slapback delay going, which I just kind of wanted to throw on these parts to make them a little bit wider. So I bring it down to like negative 17 on the send. Next, we are going to this weird guy here, which is sort of like a weird syncopated lead thing. Basically, I found this Oliver sample because I could hear some weird glass bell, cowbell thing in the background that was really fast and syncopated. But then I wanted to beef it up a little bit more. So I threw this Juno underneath it. I've been really enjoying a lot of the Arturia Juno stuff and just rewrote those notes as MIDI. And then I use some auto pan and some Kramer tape to sort of darken it up and saturate it a bit. Somebody also pointed out recently to me that uh, when you're using saturation, I tend to use it pretty liberally. When you're using this, you're not just adding saturation, you're also adding a bit of an EQ curve to it. So like a low end boost, but you're also adding a bit of compression because the distortion is coming from how hard you're driving it into the tape machine basically. And so these can add a bit of compression to a sound. And I've seen a lot of people say that they shouldn't use tape saturators for that reason. And to be clear, if you're trying to get the most transparent sound possible, I agree. But what I have found is that with these plugins, they tend to replicate a sound that we've become very accommodated to. Like basically until CDs were invented and digital Pro Tools rigs were everywhere, this was the sound of pretty much every recording you heard. And so even though it's technically not perfect in terms of transients, I find that the vibe that it adds tends to be more of a benefit. But yeah, I just saw somebody point that out and it is something to consider when you're using these. All right, next part are the keys. So I've done my normal trick here. I've basically made one chord progression in MIDI, and then I've duplicated it across a couple other patches, and then I've blended them together. So the first patch that I'm using is this Arturia DX7. Sort of this annoying, cheesy 80s sound. But then doubling that guy up with a Juno. This is like my favorite patch that I've made with it so far. Again, if you've seen any of my other videos, you know that I love Junos because they're a really great way to sort of add beef to a sound without really making it different. Like it's just sort of like a mid-range booster that you can layer underneath a pre-existing sound to make it a bit bigger, which is what I used it for here. And I've had a lot of fun with this guy, which is the last layer. This is the Emulator 2, also from the Arturia V Collection. 
It's that classic sort of 80s disco piano sound. Because this is basically a plug-in version of the Emu, which is a really vintage 80s sampler. So there's a lot of really cool sounds in plugins like this that are not like fully accurate pianos, but they have like a vibe to them. And so all of these guys mixed together sound like this. You can hear it's almost like a piano sound, but it's just got a little bit more of a texture thing going on in the background, almost like a thing, if that makes any sense. And it's playing very basic chords, like on the downbeats. And the reason I feel like they wrote the piano this way is because there's so many other moving parts of this beat that have a ton of syncopation in them. And this is a really big sound. So just having these key parts just be straight down on all of the downbeats and chord changes, it sort of provides a harmonic foundation for the rest of the beat so everything can kind of wander around a bit more. You can hear kind of the same thing with the drums, which we'll get into later. But like the bass is syncopated, the percussion is syncopated, the guitars are syncopated like everything's kind of all over the place so in order for that arrangement to work you need to simplify it in other places then here we have a horn section Nothing fancy here. This is just session horns from Contact on the Staccatissimo velocity switch. And again, I didn't really care if these sounded cheesy or fake at all, because in the original track, I feel like it was more so about having that sort of brass texture in there. So almost the same as the keys. You have this sort of long held out section followed by a couple of staccato hits. And in the context of the song, that just sort of makes it pop a bit more. It really adds to that live band feel. For mixing, we're just using the classic strip again. I wanted to mess around with the uh, custom opto module that they have now which is more of like an optical compressor and then as you can see we added a lot of saturation with like the revival stuff and then fab filter distortion i just wanted to sort of beef up that mid-range a bit so you can see on the lows and highs i actually don't have them turned on right now but in the mids i have them pretty heavily distorted which is awesome because you can get that sort of like insane grit in the mid-range and not worry about it distorting the high end which can sound not too great on horn sections and then real quick just to make it vibey i added this i added this saxophone solo that i found on Splice. Plugins have come a long way and I'm always a proponent of people using a plugin version of a sound to get it because it's really accessible in comparison to hiring a session player to come in. Having said that, I have never been able to find a solution for live saxophone recordings other than just getting a live saxophone performance. There's so many articulations and buttons and so responsive to your breath that it's honestly, in my opinion, a lot harder to arrange a saxophone solo than it is like a string section because at least with the string section, you can like hide behind sort of like a big wave of sound but with brass instruments like a saxophone it's like they're so up in your face and we know what they sound like in recordings that it's kind of hard to make them not sound stupid so in my experience if you are in a situation where the song you are doing needs saxophone i would just reach out and find a saxophone player because in my opinion you just can't replace a live saxophone take also you'll probably get something you're happy with a lot more often i'm just using this aggressive strip just because i felt like i wanted this guy to sort of smack as you can see, I pumped the saturation up. And then on both of these horn guys, we are using the standard Kramer tape, not on 7.5 IPS. I didn't want to dull the high end completely. Like I said before, I just kind of wanted to level them out and add a bit more grit to them and then give them a little bit of that EQ curve that this gives. Next up is the bass. With this track, I decided to go more so with a sound that I would use on a song like this instead of what the original sounds like because the original track is pretty vintagey in its approach to sound design. And I just struggled to get like that standard P bass sound to sort of pop out over the mix without a bunch of insane distortion. So I just did some tweaking on this dirty studio bass preset in Guitar Rig 6. And then we're just using a basic bass chain to sort of tighten things up a little bit more, adding a little bit of thickness on the end. For this sound, I just used regular P bass and something interesting about this track is um, it's playing a lot higher than you would expect it to. Like, I was surprised when I actually picked up the bass to learn the original song, how high it was up on the neck. Like, to the point where I feel like if it goes, like, a fifth above this, it doesn't really feel like it's fulfilling the role of a bass. But for some reason, it works. But yeah, this syncopated part is just sort of playing off of that basic beat that the drums are playing, sort of jumping around a lot more, a lot of staccato hits. And so for bass parts like this, I tend to flatline it a lot in terms of volume and distortion, just because in my opinion, with a bass, a majority of the dynamics you're adding shouldn't be 
around your volume because when you're playing with your fingers really hard, that doesn't really add much volume and it can actually choke out a note. So I'm actually far more interested in what you are playing and how you're playing it in terms of timing. But yeah, that's my little spiel about bass parts. Then down here, we'll zoom past percussion for a second and we'll look at our main drum sound. Super simple disco beat here. I, it won't even take that long to go through. Right now we have this kick, which is this Leno Tape Smith kick from his second sample pack on Splice. This pack is really good. I actually highly recommend it. Then for snares, we have an Oliver one shot snare disco 02, which is a majority of the sound. And then it looks like I beefed it up a little bit with a Young Bay clap just to have that sort of like loose clap feel around it. And then I just use the TS Elements hat loops for this. Normally I'm turning on warp with these guys, setting the algorithm to beat in Ableton and then transient envelope to the right. Because what you can do is you can now adjust this parameter down here and it will basically look at the transient of each hit and add like a soft envelope fade going up to the next transient. So you can actually hear if I mess around with it. So that's what it sounded like originally. And now here's what it was before. It almost has the effect of like controlling how loose your left foot is with the hi-hat stand. I use that all the time in pretty much every beat that I do. I'm using that on some capacity. And then these guys are going into a very simple drum crusher preset. Basically like most of the other chains here, I would say the only difference is there's this monster module, which is like a really heavy handed compressor. And it's made to sort of be mixed in, in like a parallel processing kind of way. So originally it was like this. Stupid, insanely compressed. But then if I pull it back, it can sort of bring it up in the back. And now for the most extensive part of this beat, the percussion. Uh, the percussion is really complicated because it's a disco beat and so everything has to be filled with percussion or these little snippets of sounds all the time. But it makes it sound really busy without being super full. So the first thing we have here is a loop of a hand drum which is adding a fun little syncopation. And then we have this guy, which is a really weird, what it calls a rhythmic enhancer. So it's made to be something that you sort of throw into a beat that sort of fills in the empty spaces, which I've had a lot of fun with recently. With this one, I'm throwing one knob pumper on it just because there's such a strong four in the floor vibe that I really only needed to fill in like a couple of small spaces. And I just find that throwing one of these guys onto a percussion track is a lot faster than trying to manually figure out or what hits do I want, what do I not want? And then we have these scratches which is like a girl fish thing. It's like one of those like spiny percussion things where you like rake the little wooden thing across it. Back in the hand drum world, we're using some bongos. I'm actually using a couple of uh, one knob pumpers for this guy. So one of them is set to a quarter note like the other one, but then I also have this very light half note one knob pumper. So it will like gradually fade up over time. So it This is another very interesting way to add rhythmic dynamics to your percussion loops if they're very like one note and you want to change them up a little bit. And then there's this guy, which I have to do a little bit of dissection. So originally it sounds like this, which is really weird, but it sounded like it could have a little bit of a vibe to it. So I threw on Metatune and just made sure that it was centering everything around the key center, which I think was B major in this one. Of course, tuning speed is set to zero. It's as fast as it can go. I mean, technically you can go above zero here, but it just zero felt fine. Then we use some bandpass filtering, some auto pan, and then again, some one knob pumper to clean it up on the ones. It's a really nice filler texture. Okay, this was the thing that I actually wanted to spend the most time on with this beat, was finding the right wind chime sounds. Cause that was one of the first things that popped out to me when I listened to this song. Like instead of a crash, it will use a wind chime. Which has this like weird sort of like phasing around your head thing. Very 80s, very disco. And then I just threw in clap impact because I felt like it was needed. And then with all these percussion guys doing some grammar tape, and then I'm using a couple of compressors here that are side chained to these kick and snare channels. So if you look at these guys, they're being pulled down. 
whenever the kick and snare are hitting. And the reason that I used this instead of that one knob pumper plugin was because specifically I wanted to be able to control the attack and release of each individual hit. And I wanted to be able to pull down things on the kick a little bit more than the snare. Mastering chain, super basic. You can watch all of my other videos to see how I do it normally. But yeah, let's listen to what the final beat sounds like. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Again, I do one of these videos every Thursday. So if you enjoy this kind of content, be sure to hit subscribe, like, all that stuff. Also, if you enjoyed this kind of style of breakdown, you should probably go check out the video I did last week where I did the same thing, but for Lainey's new song, Congrats, where we go into this sort of weird punk rock dream pop thing that they've created. Pretty interesting, you should check it out. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.